Welcome, everyone. It's nice to see you all in the audience, both in person and online today. My name is Megan Forrest, and I'm a researcher at the Berlin School of Public Health and the Institute of Public Health at the Charité. I'm happy to be joined here by my colleagues, Tobias Kort, Toivo Glatz, Chisato Ito, and Emma Liesk, who um, work really hard to put on these BEMC events. Today for May's BEMC talk, I'm really happy to be joined by Dr. Craig Pollock. We're really happy to have him here as a guest researcher at the Charité. He started last summer, and then after this coming summer, he'll return to faculty at Johns Hopkins at the School of Nursing, the School of Medicine, and the Bloomberg School of Public Health. So from here on out, I will turn it over to Craig to present his talk, The Spillover Effects of Housing Policy on Health. Great. Well, thank you, Megan. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me to talk with you today. Tobias, thank you for inviting me to be a researcher here at Charité. It's been so wonderful getting to know some of the individuals and researchers here at Charité. And so I'm, just, I'm honored and delighted to be able to give this talk. Okay. So in his book, the sociologist Matthew Desmond wrote in Evicted that, the, quote, the rent eats first. And by that, he meant that people make important trade-offs to try to keep a roof over their head. They cut back on food and skimp on medical care in order to try to keep their homes. In my work today, I'm talking about what this will look like in the U.S. context. I'll discuss ways that we are understanding the link between housing its affordability and neighborhood context. To do this, I'm gonna divide my talk into five different components. In the first part, I'll talk by examining the problem of affordable housing in the United States, as well as other links between housing and health. I'll then move on to talk about some research we've done in the setting of COVID-19, which provides a window into policy changes that never would have happened otherwise, or would have said wasn't gonna be on the policy horizon anytime soon. The third part of the talk, I'll do a really brief introduction to federal uh, US federal housing assistance, what that looks like in the United States. And then I'll use that understanding to inform some of the research we're, we've been doing on the geography of housing assistance. Here, I'll talk about two different studies that we've been working on, and then I'll end with some next steps and conclusions. Okay, so let's start with this uh, map of the United States. This map shows what it would cost an individual. Uh, so this map shows what an individual would need to earn, how much money they would need to earn per hour, working 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, in order to afford a median two-bedroom apartment across different states. You could see in Washington, D.C., where I currently live, the amount that an individual would need to earn every hour is $34.33. In contrast, the minimum wage in Washington, D.C. is $16.10 an hour. D.C.'s minimum wage is actually pretty high. The federal minimum wage in the United States is only $7.25 an hour. There's not a state in the, in the United States where one can afford uh, average cost two-bedroom apartment working a minimum wage job. Housing affordability has reached epic proportions in the United States, leading to real, uh, real housing insecurity. Uh, that's very, very common. As it stands right now, one in two renters lives in unaffordable housing, defined as spending more than 30% of their income on rent and utilities, which is kind of one of those common measures of uh, housing affordability in, in the United States. About a quarter of renters pay more than 50% of their income on rent. One in 16 renters receives an eviction filing, a notice telling them that they need to leave their home, often due to non-payment of rent. One in 43 renters in the U.S. is evicted, and one in about 600 individuals is unhoused. And coming back to the idea that the rent eats first, this is a simple bar graph showing what happens uh, to people's uh, spending across different uh, expenditure categories as their amount of spending on rent increases. So the blue bar is those that are unburdened, spending less than 30% of their income on rent and utilities, and then the severely burdened are spending more than 50%. And across each of these expenditure categories, you see a stepwise gradient where people who spend more on their rent spend less on food, they spend less on transportation, they spend less on retirement savings, and they spend less on their health care. And here, it's really important to point out that it's not that these individuals are less hungry than people that spend less on their rent. Or it's not that they're less sick than those that spend less on the rent. 
it's that they have less money, quote unquote, left under, left over after the rent eats. So housing affordability is just one of the pathways linking housing and health. This is a very, very simple framework from Lauren Taylor uh, that was published in Health Affairs. And she, is, she and others posit that there's kind of four main pathways linking housing and health. There is the stability pathway. Do you have a stable place to live, a place where it's consistent over time? The quality and safety uh, pathway, with the idea that there's harmful exposures in some people's homes that can lead to poor health. This is a place where there's a really long history in public health of studying these, these exposures, including lead, radon, and, and others. There's housing affordability, which I just talked about. And then there's the neighborhood context. I like this framework and I like these four pathways because they're simple, but this is clearly oversimplified, simplified, right? These, these pathways are, are overlapping and interacting in really critical ways. And they're also uh, framed by important structural and systemic factors, not least of, of which in the United States is structural racism, which really uh, impacts the resources that different individuals are able to, uh, to access in, in our country. So to preview one of the other pathways that I'm gonna come back to, I wanna talk for a second on the neighborhood context pathway. So this is a map of the Metro DC area where again, where I live. And it shows also kind of in the, in the Northern part, Montgomery County and Prince George's County in Maryland and Fairfax County in Virginia. And you can see here that as you ride out the, the different Metro lines, you, uh, your life expectancy changes or the life expectancy of people living in these different neighborhoods changes. So 77 years old uh, is the average life expectancy in the center of the city where I live, going out to 84 years in some of the wealthier suburban areas of, of the country. Should also say here that this map is not only depressing in terms of the geographic disparities, but also depressing when you think about the Berlin Metro map, which is like such a richer transportation structure, but not the topic of the lecture. I think this map also raises a lot of important questions about what's going on. Is this about selection of individuals into different neighborhoods, or is there something about the neighborhoods themselves that's different that impacts health? And what are some of the policy implications of thinking about neighborhood context and the selection of individuals into it? And so later on, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some ways that we've tried to disaggregate this selection effects uh, to understand what's the import, how the importance of neighborhood context uh, matters. Okay, I focused this intro on the United States, but clearly many of the problems around housing affordability are not limited to the United States. This is an article from a couple of years ago describing the court striking down rent caps in Berlin and the problems that it was expected to cause. And one of the things that I'm excited about being here is learning uh, from you all about what's happening more in the housing situation in Berlin and what are the ways that we think that some of the mechanisms that we've been studying in the United States might be transferable, might be similar, and might be different than, than those here. And thinking about the link between uh, housing and health in Germany, in 2003 and 2004, I was on leave for my medical studies and a visitor at the University of Dusseldorf where I worked on this paper with Johanna Segrist, Segrist and Olaf van den Knesbeck, uh, looking at the association between home ownership and health. Uh, here it was self-rated health uh, using a, a national survey, finding that homeowners, not surprisingly, similar to the United States and many other countries, tend to have better self-rated health than renters. And here, this was true even after controlling for some other measures of socioeconomic status, like income and education, and was partially medi mediated by housing conditions as well as the neighborhood context. Not a causal study, strictly an association here, but uh, one of the first to look at this in, in the setting of Germany. So with that as a background, let me turn to the first set of studies, which examines COVID-19 pandemic as a window into the connection between housing and health. And here I wanna remind everyone, on a beautiful day, we're not wearing masks, just how dire the situation was in 2000. There was tremendous economic and medical uncertainty. And there was really the fear that people would fall further behind on their rents, potentially uh, becoming evicted and losing their homes. Uh, so to prevent this, many states in the, in the, in the country uh, enacted eviction moratoriums, which prevented landlords from kicking tenants out of their homes. Then, 
in September of uh, 2020, the Centers for Disease Control, the US government uh, agency responsible for infectious diseases, um, issued a nationwide eviction moratorium. And in doing so, they said it was within their power to enact this eviction moratorium as a way to prevent, uh, prevent the spread of infectious disease and promote public health. This was quickly challenged by the, in the courts where a lot of people were saying that actually the CDC had overstepped their boundaries. So working with a former postdoctoral fellow, uh, now assistant professor at the University of California at Los Angeles, uh, Catherine Leipheit and others, we attempted to provide some information about whether, in, whether eviction moratoriums impacted health. And to do this, we took advantage of the fact that states really varied in that initial time period before there was a nationwide moratorium, they really varied in the extent to which they provided protection through this eviction moratorium, through this rule that prevented landlords from evicting tenants. So this map shows that there were some states that never instituted an eviction moratorium, and there were other states that kept an eviction moratorium the whole time. And then there were some where the eviction moratorium was started and then rolled back. And here you can see in a different way, this is kind of the x-axis is over time, and then the y-axis is the number of states. And you can see like early on, states were very quick to enact these moratoriums. And then over time, those, uh, many of those uh, eviction moratoriums gradually lifted. And so we thought this resembles and was uh, an important natural experiment in order to make sense of what's happening with eviction moratoriums and a range of different health outcomes. So the first thing that we studied in this was what happened with eviction moratoriums and COVID-19 uh, cases, as well as COVID-19 mortality. To do this, we did an event study analysis where the, the, we were, our main variable was the amount of time since an eviction moratorium expired compared to those states where an eviction moratorium remained in place. And we controlled for a range of different time varying covariates, including, including the amount of time I'm, I'm sorry, including testing, uh, testing rates, stay at home orders, school closures, mask mandates, and the like. And what we found was, was really striking. So this shows the weeks since the moratorium was lifted with the left side being kind of before the moratorium was lifted and the right side being uh, as the moratoriums were lifted in these states. What we found was that there was about 433,000 excess cases of COVID-19 that we thought were attributable to the, the eviction moratoriums being lifted. And this translated into a, about 10,000, almost 11,000 excess deaths. This research was used in some of the court proceedings trying to defend the eviction moratoriums, which uh, was permitted to, re to remain in place. This experience of COVID-19 and the way that these different moratoriums were enacted also allowed us to open the black box of the eviction process. So often what happens, and this varies a little bit between states and different uh, jurisdictions, is that a landlord will file notice or give a tenant notice that they're gonna be evicted. There'll be a filing associated with that, often a court hearing, a judgment, and then that judgment is enforced. Different states block different stages of this process with their eviction moratoriums. Again, creating a natural experiment in which to understand the impact of these different stages. And really we classified these eviction moratoriums across different states into two different categories. The first were strong eviction moratoriums that prevent displacement and uh, prevent the legal ramifications by stopping people, stopping landlords from giving notice, from saying you're gonna be evicted. And then there are weaker moratoriums that block the later stages in the process. So an individual will say, we'll hear that they're being evicted, we'll receive notice that it'll be filed in court, but then they won't be taken to court to have, that, uh, to have a judgment rendered in them to be evicted. And we postulated that, that these stronger, stronger measures would be more beneficial to health and well-being, specifically for mental health, recognizing that this can be often a very long and stressful drawn out process. And so using survey data that was uh, done many points of time along the way, we found that this was exactly the case. So here you see that the, this is the estimated percent of respondents with moderate or severe distress um, at a population level um, from those that had uh, no eviction moratoriums in place, 
versus those that had strong eviction moratoriums in place on the right side. And you could see here that the effect size is relatively small on a pop, uh, on a individual level, but I, we think meaningful from a population perspective that there was a significant association with stronger moratoriums being associated with less mental distress compared to those that have uh, uh, no moratoriums or just the weak moratoriums in place. Next, what we did was we fielded a, a nationwide survey. And one of the parts of the survey, which was a panel survey designed to assess kind of different responses to the COVID pandemic, was we asked landlord, we asked individuals whether they agree or disagree that preventing landlords from evicting tenants is important for slowing COVID-19 disease transmission. And we found that the, the population that we surveyed was roughly equally split. So about half agreed or strongly agreed that they thought that, that this was associated with health. And the other half said, no, it doesn't seem like this is really related to health. Next, what we did was we asked about a series of different policy pres uh, prescriptions that were, being, that were being highlighted in terms of eviction moratoriums, moratoriums from people that are homeowners being, uh, being kicked out of their homes, being foreclosed upon, increasing the amount of rental assistance and emergency rental assistance for individuals. And what we found was that if you agreed that there was a, this connection between housing and health, as judged by this question, you were much, much more likely to support these different policy initiatives. And for me, again, this is not a causal argument that I'm trying to make in any way, but I think for me, it kind of makes the case of, well, maybe there's something about framing some of our housing policy as really health policy as well, that maybe there's ways to build public support for some of the housing measures that depending on the, your perspective may not always be as popular if we view it from a health perspective and understand and really quantify what are the health impacts of providing some of these different assistances. So I'm gonna to move to the next part of the talk, which uh, is uh, about uh, federal rental assistance and the geography of federal rental assistance. Um, in order to do that, I'm gonna give a very quick primer on kind of what is the landscape of rental assistance in the United States. And by this, I mean assistance that's focused towards renters, people that are not homeowners. There's different assistance that's available for homeowners in terms of tax incentives. And I'm also importantly not talking about uh, income supports that are, are different, things like uh, social security or ways that, that the government puts money directly in people's pockets because uh, and employment benefits and the like, those, those are, are different, also very, very important and also you know, an important part of the equation when you're thinking about housing affordability. It's really a, a balance between the housing costs versus the resources in, in the family. So the types of, uh, the big player in uh, federal rental assistance in the United States is the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. Their rental assistance serves about 5.4 million households uh, in the United States, representing about 10 million individuals. Eligibility for this assistance is based on income, and it really tends to be those individuals and households that have the lowest income. They provide assistance in a way that, such that it, it caps the out-of-pocket payment that a family needs to make to 30% of their income, recognizing that even 30% of income for the lowest income households can still be quite substantial. And this is uh, done in typically three different programs. The first program is called public housing, in that the government owns and operates these housing buildings. These have often been located in lower income areas. They often tend to concentrate poverty uh, in ways that's been uh, largely decried uh, in, 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 in many debates. The next type are housing vouchers. These are vouchers that an individual receives and they're used to rent uh, an apartment from a private landlord. Uh, in theory, these can be used anywhere where they can find an affordable housing unit. I'm gonna talk a lot about the location of these vouchers. And then the last are these multifamily housing, and that's something I'm not gonna go into uh, today, but it's kind of important for the complement. Really critical is that not everybody that's eligible for housing assistance in the United States actually receives it. So only about a quarter of individuals in the United States that are eligible for housing assistance actually get it. So in Baltimore, where Johns Hopkins is, they opened up the wait list for a very short period of time on the order of weeks, and they got tens of thousands of applications in this very short period of time. 
And then the housing authority that runs these wait lists said, we're going to close the wait list because we know we're not going to get through it, everyone. And so we don't want to give people more false hope by keeping these wait lists open. Um, so there's wait lists for public housing, there's wait lists for vouchers and, and the like. This type of, uh, th this type of eligibility and not everyone getting it is really important, uh, first of all, from a policy perspective and something that there's been a lot of advocacy around trying to expand this to make benefits more widely available. But also from a research perspective, it creates a really Im important natural experiment and something that we've been using in a lot of our research, not research I'm going to share in detail today, but to make the case of like, can you look at people on the wait list for housing assistance that are otherwise similar to people that get housing assistance in order to look at what's the impact of housing assistance in order to build a case of why the health benefits might matter and why uh, policymakers may want to think about expanding eligibility for this. We've also been using this, I should say that most places don't keep a wait list of their housing in ways that's accessible to researchers in the, in the United States. So one of the things we've been doing is we've been leveraging the timing on which, of which people get off the wait list to create a wait list group versus those that get off the wait list in the future to create really nice comparisons that are, we hope balanced on both observable characteristics, but also unobservable characteristics. Um, so um, the other thing about vouchers that I really want to point out, so this is a map of uh, Baltimore, again, where Johns Hopkins is, and you can see that the darker blue areas are uh, rates, places with higher rates of poverty. Baltimore, like uh, many U.S. cities, is highly segregated by racialized group. It's also highly segregated by income. And here you can see that many of the people that have vouchers, maybe it's a little bit hard to see, um, are more likely to be located in uh, poor, under-resourced neighborhoods. This is despite the fact that theoretically they could use their vouchers in other neighborhoods. But there's lots of structural factors in place that make it very, very hard for individuals to use their vouchers to access uh, neighborhoods that have uh, that have more resources in them. And so this is one of the things that policymakers have been interested in trying to kind of understand more about and try to uh, address to a certain extent. Some of this grows out of fair housing lawsuits. So there was a law that was passed that was about trying to uh, limit discrimination in the housing market. And uh, different uh, advocacy groups have sued uh, the different organizations that have been doing this type of housing assistance, saying that you're violating these fair housing laws by uh, concentrating individuals that receive public housing assistance into poor under-resourced neighborhoods. As part of the remedy for that, as part of the kind of the settlement for this lawsuit, they've said some of those have been successful and they've said, okay, we're gonna help you as part of this, as part of this lawsuit, uh, give people the opportunity to move to less poor neighborhoods. And so that's a lot of what I'm gonna be studying here. And these kind of lawsuits that led to this deconcentration of poverty that led to individuals being more able to move to resource neighborhoods creates a, a really important uh, natural, and as I'll show you, uh, kind of unnatural experiment. So that leads me to this research on the geography of housing assistance. And the study I wanna talk about now is something called the moving to opportunity social experiment. So this kind of based on some promising findings from this, uh, the results of the fair housing lawsuit and following people that had moved as a result of this in Chicago, the US government responsible for this type of housing assistance created a randomized control trial. They randomized about 4,500 families living in public housing in really poor neighborhoods in five different cities across the United States to three different groups. One was a control group. One was a group where they received a housing voucher and said, you can rent wherever you find a place. And the last was a, called an experimental voucher. And this was a voucher that needed to be used in a low poverty neighborhood. The idea that they did a randomized control trial of a uh, social policy was pretty amazing, right? Like, and it's, I think it's not that common in the United States and I think many other places to do this type of randomized control trial, but it's been really, really important in the kind of the social science world because it's able to disaggregate this kind of, is it selection into neighborhoods or is it individual characteristics that's so often nearly impossible to tease apart, right? Like you're randomizing individuals to different, uh, different options that allow access to different types of neighborhoods. 
So, and MTO has led to a number of important findings, including uh, recently there was an article, recently now seven years ago, uh, there was an article by uh, an economist named Raj Chetty and others who found that children who were randomized to receive a voucher at a young age had higher earnings as an adult. And this is really, really important because if you imagine you're a policymaker and you're thinking like, is it worthwhile to provide some degree of services that's going to cost more money? Um, but if there's payoffs in the end and these payoffs lead to people maybe being less likely to receive housing assistance in the future or paying less for their housing assistance, this was a very, very big deal. There were also some studies that showed that people that were received uh, assistance to move to low poverty neighborhoods had reductions in diabetes and obesity risk. Children's health, there was some indication that it varied uh, by gender with uh, boys tending to do a little bit worse, girls tending to do a little bit better in ways that uh, is controversial and questions, kind of raising questions about the mechanisms and then little change in, in physical health initially. So what we wanted to do is coming at this uh, many years later was to try to understand to what extent moving to opportunity was associated with healthcare use over a very long period of time. And to do that, we linked the individual data with two different types of data available in the United States. The first is all payer data. So I'm not gonna go into the insurance system in the United States because it will like leave you all in tears, but to say that there are some states that report the different types of insurance data when someone goes to a hospital, they bill the insurance company and the insurance company will usually sometimes hopefully pay for it. Um, and that, that can be reported uh, so you can understand when people go to the hospital, what are the reasons they go to the hospital? What are the diagnoses that are being billed for? How much is the hospital charging for, for these types of visits? And the other type of data that we have from some states is Medicaid data. Medicaid is an insurance program that covers low-income uh, individuals and households. And there we have more data, not just hospitalization, but data on outpatient services, as well as diagnoses and other things as well. So uh, these are the five states. Apologize for the abbreviation. So California, Illinois, Massachusetts, New York, and Maryland. And these are the different types of data that, that we received in the years of the data. What this translates into is for some of the states we have starting the year after a household was randomized uh, until 20 years later, uh, up to 20, 21 years later in New York. So we have a really long period of time on which we can observe these individuals uh, as, as they have touch points with the medical system in their state. In the end, this, this was about 55,000 person years of data on adults and about 122,000 person years of data on about 9,000 kids that were in the sample. So really a, a lot of data. And like, I can talk about the linkage process. It was not easy. I know that the, you know, the kind of standards for data privacy are very different in the EU versus the United States. It was still not easy in the United States. So this graph shows kind of what's the poverty rate in the five years after randomization among people that got the experimental voucher versus the section eight, which is the traditional voucher versus those in the control group. And it was not very good. So in general, only about half of the people that received a voucher were able to move to a low poverty neighborhood. And many of those that moved to a low poverty neighborhood didn't end up living in that neighborhood for very long. So as an experiment, amazing that they were able to randomize 4,500 individuals but the implementation of the experiment and helping families move and access resources of the different neighborhoods, not great. And as I'll talk about later in the next experiment, uh, much better, uh, much better today in different in different programs. And so what you see here is the experience of these two different voucher groups on the left ended up being very, very similar in terms of the types of neighborhoods that they were exposed to on average, uh, the levels of neighborhood neighborhood poverty, poverty that they that they saw. And so in the analyses that I'm going to talk about just now, we combine these groups together to compare it to the control group. And um, before I go on, I should say that the we did a bunch of analyses on adults looking at hospitalizations and ED visits. They were all awash. It didn't make any difference for adult healthcare utilization over the 20 year follow up. However, for kids, we did see uh, a difference. And so the top line with the circles is kids that received a voucher. The bottom line uh, 
I guess they both have circles, sorry. The bottom line are uh, kids that were in the control group. And here you can see, especially if you squint, that the, the people that received vouchers tended to have, uh, sorry that I said that backwards. So the top, the top line is people in public housing, the bottom line are people that receive vouchers. And you can see here that the bottom line, the lower line, slightly lower rates of hospitalizations as well as hospital spending. We then separated this out looking at older and younger kids. You can see here the, the diamonds are the older kids where the, the lines are really overlapping. Where the younger children, you see significant differences where those children whose family received a voucher tended to have lower rates of hospitalization. So for younger kids, the average rates of hospitalizations per 100 person years was about 5.3 hospitalizations in the voucher groups versus 6.6 .6 in the control groups. When we did a cost analysis, looking at among those that actually moved, so a treatment on treated analysis, we found that this led to about $500 in yearly hospital spending. So the amount kids thankfully are generally pretty healthy. They tend not to be hospitalized all that often. But you can also see here that the savings uh, in terms of number of hospitalizations and then conditional on actually moving to a low poverty neighborhood, the uh, rate of hospital spending was significantly lower in ways that we think are, are quite meaningful. So I'm gonna now move from this kind of overall global picture of healthcare spending and healthcare use that we got from moving to opportunity over a very long period of time and instead focus more micro uh, on asthma and talk about a study that we did in Baltimore. And here there's a really lots of great reasons to study asthma and its association with housing conditions and neighborhood conditions. We know in the United States in urban areas, uh, especially poor urban areas, about a quarter of children have asthma. And it's one of the leading reasons why children get uh, taken to the emergency room and admitted uh, to the hospital. And we also know that housing exposures are some of the leading causes of these asthma exacerbations. Specifically in Baltimore City, mouse exposures and mouse allergens are really important. And we also know that there have been a lot of uh, places where there, people have gone in and tried to do environmental uh, interventions to try to help these families where their children have asthma. They often go in with air filters or go in with special vacuums or um, uh, kind of bed covers. And really what we've seen is that those interventions often have mixed effects. And mixed meaning that they, they don't often work very well, they're often hard to have sustained effects. And some of that is, you can imagine that it can be really hard to eradicate mouse uh, allergens in neighborhoods where these mouse exposures are endemic, in places where there are row homes that are connected to one another or where there are apartments. And so we designed the Mobility Asthma Project as a study in order to try to understand what's the impact of neighborhood change and moving uh, on these children's experience with asthma. This is a prospective cohort study of 140 children with asthma who were enrolled in the Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership. The Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership is our community partner, and they're a group that was started after a fair housing lawsuit, again, saying that uh, the, the, the city of Baltimore and the US Department of Housing and Urban Development were, were sued saying that they were uh, concentrating poverty leading to uh, the, 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 the further segregation of individuals. As part of the remedy for this, they created housing vouchers that helped about 5,000 people to date move from areas of inner city Baltimore, very high poverty neighborhoods into much lower poverty neighborhoods. We recruited children uh, from July 2016 and followed them through the start of COVID. We now have been re-recruiting them and, and following them for a longer period of time. And we included kids that were five to 17 years old with persistent asthma, which uh, we defined in different ways. So this, these are not pictures of the housing from our, uh, of our respondents, but this is giving you a sense. So the top picture shows some row housing in Baltimore City, and you can see that this row housing is in, in pretty poor condition. Um, on the bottom, these are housing from the suburbs um, where many of the families move more into houses like this. So really pretty dramatic neighborhood changes. We did really detailed data collection 
We did uh, a baseline visit and then home visits every six months with phone calls every three months um, to assess their asthma. And then as part of the visits, we did uh, we did dust, ex ex uh, dust collection for allergen exposures. We did uh, air filters for indoor particulate matter. We did lung function via spirometry. We did a, a whole host of different measures that, 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 we, uh, that we've been using with our main outcome measure being the rates of exacerbation in the, the past three months, and then the maximum symptom days, which is uh, defined according to a, a couple of different measures of asthma. And this was our main finding, kind of a simple pre-post, right? Where it shows that those experiencing at least one exacerbation in the last three months, the dark blue is pre-move, significantly being reduced in the post-move. After adjusting for age uh, and age and gender, we find that this is associated with a 54% reduced odds of asthma associated with moving. This effect size, as my uh, pediatric allergist colleagues will tell me, is really quite large and impressive. So it's kind of similar and even larger than some of the effects of inhaled corticosteroids and similar to the rate of obser uh, observed with biologic agents. So we think these findings are, are important and significant. However, uh, this is an epi seminar, right? So th the whole idea that there is potential confounding, yes. What we did to try to begin to get at that was there's confounding and also with asthma, we know that it typically gets better as children get, get older. So we uh, use a control group from a birth call cohort called the Urban Environment and Childhood Asthma or Eureka cohort. And basically from this birth co cohort, which was uh, recruited uh, pregnant women who were more likely to have children that were gonna be, uh, have allergen sensitizations and go on to develop asthma. They were recruited from different cities, uh, one of which being Baltimore that had high prevalences of uh, poverty. And they were assessed in a very similar way with similar outcomes as, uh, as we did. And we did, we created a list of all potential visits when a Eureka participant would have potentially been uh, eligible to participate in the Mobility Asthma Project. And then we matched them to, uh, to the MAP participants using a five to one propensity score matching. Uh, we created kind of a pseudo move date for the, the MAP participants because again, the I'm sorry, for the Eureka participants, because Eureka participants weren't moving, right? Like the MAP participants, our group was moving. And so we, we, we did this to try to balance out this effect. Happy to talk about it in more detail. What we found was that there was a significant change in asthma exacerbations in the MAP cohort in our mobility asthma project cohort. There was no such change in Eureka cohort, giving us some uh, more confidence in our findings. So I think the, the next thing we did was really trying to figure out, well, given that there are these changes and exacerbations, do we have any understanding of why that might be happening? What might be going on that's, that's leading to these changes? And for this, we found that there was a real decrease in mouse allergen levels, decreased by about 50%, as well as cockroach allergen levels decreasing by about 83%. In contrast, some of the other exposures that we measured in terms of cat, dog, and dust mite allergens, those increased sig significantly with, movie, with moving. However, when we ran the mediation analyses, uh, we found that these allergens and these changes did not consistently mediate the association between moving and exacerbations. We were a little puzzled by this, and we think there's a lot of different theories we have. Some of it might be the fact that these allergen levels are going in different directions, because again, the background literature is really strong linking it, you know, some of these exposures, mouse and cockroach in particularly, and asthma exacerbations. We also think that relatively few of our individuals out of the 123 that moved were uh, sensitized to like, for example, mouse allergens and exposed to high levels at baseline. So we might've been underpowered to see some of this mediating effect when uh, could have been there. However, really the key thing that we found was that uh, individuals that moved they reported much feeling much safer in their neighborhoods, having much less uh, stress, stress due to their urban environment, and having greater levels of social cohesion in their new neighborhood. And those factors, all of which are associated with one another, right? Not independent, but clearly social cohesion is related to neighborhood safety, related to urban stress. But these mediated about a third of the association between moving and uh, and asthma exacerbations in ways that we think is, is quite significant. 
Uh, so this work will be coming out in JAMA in um, hopefully about two weeks, I believe. So we're excited to have this uh, come out. And we think there's lots of reasons why stress might be a, a potential mediator and pathway here. So one of the reasons uh, is that there's changing norms, changing beliefs around health compromising behaviors that could affect asthma that may be associated with stress. We also think that there's the potential that it could increase your ability to access uh, health services. This is something we looked at kind of, does, is this related to changes in medications that we would see in our cohort? And we didn't see that there was medication intensification along the way that would explain our findings. Really importantly, a lot of these exposures that we're measuring are indoor exposures and feeling safe in your neighborhood allows you to spend more time outdoors, spend more time not in your house in ways that, that is uh, important and uh, can be related to the outcomes. And then, we also know that there's some evidence to suggest that there's maybe a direct psychological, psychological impact uh, from stress on airway reactivity. And so that, that also may be going on. All of these are things to potentially continue studying and uh, understanding in, in the future. So next steps and conclusions. So there've been a lot of interest from a policy perspective in some of these housing mobility programs. In 2018 and 2019, the United States government passed two different acts, which uh, allocated about $50 million to use towards a new housing mobility experiment. Here, the idea is there are the new findings from Moving to Opportunity showing the economic and health benefits of this type of work. And so they wanna see, can they do a better job than Moving to Opportunity in helping families move to less poor neighborhoods? And so once again, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development is starting a new randomized control trial where they're gonna test different services that hopefully will be much better than moving to opportunity in helping families with housing assistance move from areas of high poverty into much lower uh, poverty neighborhoods. We recently received uh, funding for a study called the MOVE study or Mobility Opportunity Vouchers to Eliminate Disparities, where we're gonna be following a sample of 900 adults and children participating in this new mobility program, where we're gonna do baseline and two-year follow-up data, where the funding came, comes from the, the National Institutes of Health, and, and they're particularly interested in obesity and diabetes risk. We'll be examining a whole different range of pathways, uh, some of which are probably outcomes in their own right, looking at the impact of housing and neighborhood environments on, on these different health outcomes. We've also been working with our neighborhood, uh, with our community partner to develop a healthy children's voucher demonstration. And what this is, is a way for healthcare providers to refer children who have, for example, significant asthma and are maybe living in unhealthy environments to receive the type of mobility and counseling that may help their families move. We're doing a, a, a kind of a pragmatic evaluation of this type of program to see, is it feasible to have this type of program in practice? What does it look like from kind of an effort and uh, cost perspective? So with that, I wanna say that these types of policy experiments um, and uneven implementation offer really important opportunities and windows into studying the connection between housing and health. And I think that the connection between housing and health can be really quite profound. The results suggest that interventions to improve housing affordability, stability, and the neighborhood context are potentially positioned to uh, have impacts on health generally, especially children's health as we move forward. So this research involved a ton of different uh, collaborators uh, across many different universities. So want to do a big shout out to the, the team, as well as some of the community partners we worked with, as well as uh, many of the funders, including the National Institutes of Health and a foundation in the United States called the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So with that, I'm going to end the talk and uh, open it up for questions. <laughs>